thank you for coming down. Uh, this is our first seminar for the year, our first proper face-to-face -face seminar, and we thought it was the most relevant thing to do is talk about the nutritional needs for youth athletes today. So what I've done today, I've actually insisted the help of uh, Laura McMullen. She's a sports dietitian. Um, she does have a background in weightlifting, powerlifting, also a competitive athlete as well. Um, I'll hand it off to her in a second, but just, yeah, the background of why I've decided to go with this one specifically, because COVID really did throw a span in the works. Uber Eats, you know, their share price went up, everyone was consuming it, like left, right and centre. So I figured this is a nice way, start of the year, get you guys back on the bandwagon and also help those who you help as well, specifically. I'll hand it over. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Stand up to the side. Thanks everyone for coming down today. Really, really quite cool that there are a lot of people here interested in learning a bit about nutritional needs for youth athletes. Um, so, yep, yeah, thank you so much, Trent, for hosting this event and for having me down and organising everything. He's put everything here together today, so that's been really great. All right, so before we start, it would be awesome if everybody could put their phones to silence. If you do need to make a phone call, answer a phone call or anything like that, just try and be, not interrupt the seminar um, and you know, leave that at the front door if you can. Um, and hopefully, um, I'd like it if everyone could keep their questions to the end. We're going to do a bit of a, a Q&A, a formal Q&A where you know, everyone can ask their questions and then a bit later after we've had a bit of a break, we'll um, have a bit more of an informal discussion where we can talk a bit more about things that you want to know a bit more about. Um, and of course, if you would like any more personalised advice, um, you are more than welcome to approach me at the end and we can organise something further, um, but otherwise, um, enjoy. So, um, I had a bit of a sit down and think about what I really want everybody to get out of this seminar. And these are the main objectives I came up with. So what I really want is for parents to feel really confident in supporting their young athletes. I want athletes to feel empowered and engaged with eating for performance and take some real ownership of, uh, of their nutritional strategies and what they need to do to support their development. What I want is parents and athletes to have an, uh, develop an understanding of key nutritional foundations for youth athletes and to understand weight and body composition and energy availability in young athletes. I also want uh, parents and athletes to know how to seek credible advice, where to look for it and um, how to decipher uh, all of the junk that's out there. There's certainly a lot on social media and a lot of people are uh, spouting their opinions and things like that, so I really want to support uh, everyone to look at credible advice. Um, and I also want to give a bit of an overview um, of supplements at the end, and uh, so people can understand their role in, support, in sport and where they may or may not suit with, um, with most athletes. All right, so a bit of a disclaimer to start with. Um, this is not a substitute for professional medical advice and shouldn't be relied on as health or personal advice. Uh, you should always seek the guidance of your doctor or any other qualified health professional with any questions you may have regarding your personal health or your medical conditions. All right, so why should we even look at nutrition? So obviously foods, uh, the foods that we eat uh, provide the building blocks for our development. From the most obvious ones being like uh, muscle gain and things like that, to things where, uh, which may not be so obvious, which is your bone strength and your immune development and things like that. What we eat, we eat every single day and uh, with the, anything that we do every day, it can have really long standing effects on how, whether we prosper in our health or whether we um, are potentially causing uh, health complications and deficiencies down the line. Food helps us perform better and the reason it does that is because it provides the fuel that we need to actually do everything that we do in our daily lives and perform at our best every single time. Nutrition is uh, something that everybody should know about and the unfortunate truth is that it's not well taught in schools and uh, there is just so much misinformation and things like that which is such a shame because 
it really is as important as sleep, stress management and exercise as well. Um, and learning the fundamentals will absolutely set you up for life. Now, this will be a little bit content heavy, I'm sorry, um, but we'll, we'll get through it. So, to set the scene, um, has anybody seen this uh, Australian Guide to Healthy Eating before? Could you raise your hand? Yep, so it is most of the group, which is fantastic. It is a uh, government mandated uh, guide and it is the most condensed, uh, friendly version for consumers to look at to understand what makes up a healthy diet. What you can see is five main food groups. Um, so there's grains, there's vegetables, fruit, dairy, and lean proteins, pretty much. Um, so the reason that this kind of thing is brought together and the purpose of it is to make sure that people have an understanding of what a diet should be made up of. We've certainly got a lot of information available to us to figure out what to decipher what can be part of a good diet. And this is a culmination of the best research available that has been compiled uh, and uh, presented by experts in this field. So definitely something to um, use as your foundation when you're thinking about what a diet should look like. Certainly a very good place to start. All right, and going a bit further into it is there is recommendations for how many serves of everything that people should have. I've just brought out the, uh, the recommended servings for uh, youth, so for both boys and girls. So the age ranges I've got here are just from 12 to 18. So as you can see, it will tell you um, that for uh, boys aged 12 to 13, you'll be looking at five and a half serves of vegetables, legumes and beans. And what that actually looks like is one serve of vegetables is about 75 grams, which is half a cup, or if it's easy to think about, is about half a fist. Um, and for fruit, say it's two serves per, um, per day uh, on average, and a one serve of fruit is about a fist size. So that might look like uh, a whole banana, or it might be two small nectarines, or something like that. A uh, serve of grains is about 500 kilojoules, they don't really give a weight range because there is so many different forms that it sort of comes in, but grains is sort of referring to uh, pastas, rice, um, breads, things like that. And for example, one serve of uh, grains is about one serve of bread. And ideally what you'd be going for with your grains and things like that is ones that are, have a bit more whole grain in them. So what that really means is that it will have extra seeds or it'll be a wholemeal sort of type or something like that, um, which just means that it has a lot more fibre in it. Uh, and then next is the serve of lean meat and poultry, fish, eggs, nuts and seeds, legumes and beans, around the same sort of energy contribution as grains, but another good rule of thumb for the amount is the size of your palm. Uh, and then finally, serve of milk, yogurt, cheese, and alternatives, so all of your dairy products. And that's around uh, yep, 500, 600 kilojoules, and that looks like about a cup of milk, so which is about 250 mils. All right. So what, do, what additional needs might athletes have? So starting with a nice foundation of the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and meeting all of the, looking after those food groups for all of the micronutrients and all of the energy that they provide and uh, making sure that we ensure that there is adequate energy available for normal healthy development and regular functioning. And then what we also look at is an, what additional intake might be required for them to actually be able to perform at their best with their athletic endeavour. Because the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is looking at um, your an average sort of uh, team or average person, and that's not an athlete. An athlete is someone who is exerting themselves on a regular basis for the pursuit of uh, performance. And so when we're thinking of athletes, we're gonna need to think about having those extra things on. So fuel to perform. 
All right, so I've put together sort of an example day of what um, the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating might look like if you were to bring it in for, a, um, for an athlete. Looking at, say, a 15-year-old male, plays footy for a local club and has training after school. So this might be what a day would look like for someone, uh, someone like this. So you might have your bowl of cereal, looking at wheat bix providing some of the sustenance from the grain group there, looking at having a contribution of uh, milk, so dairy, um, and some fruit there. We might have a, a morning tea snack, something that's got a bit more dairy in it, a bit of salt, and some multi-grain crackers, so again, another serve of, of grains. Um, lunch might be something like a bread roll um, with mixed salad, ham and butter uh, and you might have some carrot sticks, hummus and a muesli bar on the side as well. So really trying to maintain a certain level of energy throughout the day and then in the afternoon might have something else, something a bit smaller but also something a bit richer in carbohydrates. Le thinking about when we're going into that training session what we're after is having enough energy on board, and that's the purpose of that one. Um, and then after dinner, uh, after training, what you're looking for is something to really help replenish you. Um, looking at, yeah, something like pastas and lentil and beef bolognese, and then getting in some more vegetables, a bit of colour, and things like that, and then potentially a snack at the end of the day, just to make sure that we are constantly having enough food on board to make sure that we are recovering and uh, enabling adaptation to the training stimulus that we have undertaken. So for, um, for, so for some of you, this might look like tons of food, it might look like nowhere near enough, uh, and that's sort of the, the beauty of nutrition, is that there is certainly large scope and different people need to have different needs. All right, so is there anything different to consider for youth athletes compared to adults? There are certain physiological differences which are quite obvious, some being that um, they will be in different phases of development, going through their growth spurts and things like that. So, uh, for example, in their physical stature, your, the trunk might grow a lot longer than the legs to start with and things like that. So those things have to be taken into consideration. Um, when uh, adolescents sweat, they usually don't sweat anywhere near as much as you do when you become an adult. And so that means that your fluid losses aren't anywhere near as high as when you are an adult athlete. Obviously it varies a lot um, from person to person, but that's a good thing to be aware of. Um, you also don't lose as much salt in your sweat either. So um, I'm sure everyone's heard of like, you know, Gatorade and Powerade and all of that, and that's supposed to replace electrolytes and electrolytes being like your salts and things like that. Um, not so necessary at all for youth athletes because they're not losing the amount of salts through their skin, uh, through sweat, as they do when, you're, when you've uh, reached your maturity. Um, you're also uh, still building your bone mass and things like that, so there is a lot of, uh, lot of growth going on that really needs to be taken into consideration, which might also mean that um, for some people, uh, they might want to be trying to like lose weight or try and manage their, um, their growth and things like that. But it's going to be really important at this stage of their life that they're encouraged to fuel for their development and actually have enough energy on board to continue to build those things up to their peak bone mass. Because unfortunately, we get to a certain point in our lives where that will uh, reach its peak and, uh, and then only get worse from there. All right. So next I want to cover what is actually in food. Um, and so we're going to look a little bit more deeply at macronutrients. Has anybody here um, heard of macronutrients and things like that, pretty across that kind of stuff? I will go through um, in detail the main purpose uh, in the body of each of these macronutrients as well. Um, we'll look at micronutrients, uh, we'll look at fibre and we'll also look at water. So, starting off, first came off the rank, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates refers to sugars and starches and it is the most rapidly and rapidly digested and utilised fuel. So 
what the, re the reason I um, highlight that is because it is your body's preferred fuel source for when you're wanting to do high intensity effort. So definitely an important part of your diet for an athlete. It offers 16 kilojoules of energy per gram and it is stored in your body as well. It's stored as uh, something called glycogen with a couple of other molecules of water in your liver and in your muscles where it can be used locally in the muscle. So, uh, and yeah, so and uh, some excellent sources of carbohydrates include the groups, a uh, couple of groups like the grains and things like that, breads, pastas, fruit, uh, vegetables to an extent contribute some um, carbohydrate, but there are certainly some that have a lot more in them like potato and things like that versus ones that are a much more higher water content and otherwise just have fibre, maybe a tiny bit of protein. All right. And next we'll look at fats. So fats are quite slowly digested. They're not digested in the same way as protein and carbohydrates are. They go through a different system and they're not, they're not great for rapid energy production. So having a high fat uh, food or something like that before training isn't gonna be the best idea because it won't provide you rapid energy that you're looking for to get the most out of that session. Fats are necessary, however, because they, can, they are actually a very important part of all the cells in your body, and they also are an extremely important part of uh, hormone development. So you cannot go in a super, super low on your fats either. Um, you definitely need to have a good source of fats in your diet. And there are certain uh, subtypes of fats that uh, you really want to be emphasising in your diet and those are from the unsaturated group so that's usually things that are not animal based so the fats that you find in grains and um, seeds and uh, things like that those are the ones that you're sort of looking for a bit more um, with the exception of salmon and tuna and eggs and things like that which have a higher proportion of it as well and finally, protein, everyone's most favourite. Um, so protein provides a similar amount of energy uh, per gram as carbohydrates. It is made up of tiny little blocks called amino acids. The, um, lots of different kinds of proteins have lots of different kinds of amino acids in them. Um, however, there are 20 that are considered essential, which just means that we absolutely have to get it from the diet. Our bodies do not make it themselves. Protein is completely essential for healthy function, uh, and athletes in particular benefit from increased protein intake to support their adaptations to a training stimulus. And um, also important to note, uh, unlike, um, say, fats and uh, carbohydrates, protein isn't actually stored um, as in a readily available form for use, of, use for energy and things like that. And instead, what you'll need to do throughout the day is have regular amounts of protein so that you are sitting in a net protein state, which just means that you're having more protein than your body is breaking down. It's a constant fluctuation of breakdown and build up, and so having a constant supply of uh, protein throughout the day will support uh, ad adaptation and development. Uh, something that's also important to consider is protein quality, and protein quality is determined by the biological suitability of the amino acids that are in it. Um, obviously that can sound a bit like complicated, but for, um, for all intents and purposes, having things that are more of an animal-based protein, like your meats, your dairy sources and eggs and things like that, those are the most bioavailable sources of protein, so they will actually give you the best benefit um, as far as uh, thinking about repair and um, muscle building and things like that. Okay. All right, quick look at micronutrients. So if you follow the recommendations of the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and look at those serving sizes and things like that and try and hit those as regularly as you can, you'll do a really good job at hitting your micronutrients.
So not eating too close to training, but close enough that the energy that you're consuming is actually useful for that session. And preparation. So having a good plan in place, what your day might look like in terms of nutrition. We certainly can get distracted by tons of other things. So having a bit of a plan in place of, right, so I need to have uh, my breakfast organised because I'm so busy in the morning. I need to make sure I have a morning tea set up. I need my pre-training snack organised so I don't have to think about this later in the afternoon and waste time trying to figure that out. And it also helps a lot uh, because tons of things happen on game day and even just day-to-day -day training that uh, you haven't planned for. So making sure that you are nice and organised with your nutrition makes a big difference in the long run. Next one is periodisation. So periodisation in the scheme of uh, your whole year, looking at pre-season, off-season, in-season and game day and things like that. Um, and also maybe looking at uh, your carbohydrate periodisation, which I mean in terms of having your carbohydrates, so, so your quick source of energy close to training, so it is a really good source of fuel for your training session and things like that. It also can be a useful um, periodisation in terms of manipulating your body composition, so through phases of uh, maybe a calorie deficit and calorie uh, scarcity versus um, overreaching and trying to really build. There are different, very different types of um, periodisation, but certainly a key element of sports nutrition. And finally, longevity. And this is something that a lot of youth athletes forget about. They're very much in the now, what um, game is on the weekend and what, uh, what matters for this season and this, this time. And it's really important to actually look at what, uh, whether you're, what you're doing now is actually going to uh, let you perform again and again and again, or whether you're just going to go backwards or stay in the, one, in the same place uh, with your performance. Um, it also means managing your stress that is placed on the body and managing the nutritional adequacy for the stage of life that you're actually in. So again, going back to say when uh, your pre-growth uh, spurt for a young female athlete um, versus when you're now uh, experiencing menstruation and your cycle and things like that. Definitely need to be aware of that kind of stuff because uh, it certainly will change your uh, long-term outlook on your performance. Uh, we now also need to look at energy availability. I'll explain a bit more about what I mean by that soon um, and making sure that you're working with your body, not against it. So listening to the cues your body gives you, not trying to just forge ahead with the plan that you have in mind without uh, considering the realities of the situation. All right, quick look at weight and body composition. So weight really just assesses your uh, body's relationship with gravity. It's uh, obviously very easy to measure, can be a useful tool if the key measure of success is weight change, but there are some major pitfalls with uh, focusing heavily on your weight. It doesn't distinguish between uh, how much fat, muscle or fluid that you have, and it doesn't demonstrate any compositional changes in these things. And it also doesn't take into account your height and doesn't determine your actual performance out output, which is actually what we're here for in the end of the day, not actually the weight. All right, and body composition is um, what proportions of matter your body is made up of. Uh, so water, skeletal muscle, organs, hair, fat, minerals, and things like that gives a lot more information about the level of muscle, fat and hydration status and can show changes over time of composition. So if you are someone uh, really aiming to increase your muscle mass and decrease your fat mass, looking into your body composition is a lot more of a useful tool. Um, taking physical measurements with tape measures and calipers provides many more indicators of uh, progress compared to just taking your weight. Pitfalls are it's a little bit more difficult and uh, to measure, and uh, it certainly doesn't also doesn't necessarily determine your performance output either. 
But just a really important thing to sort of touch on because people do get really focused on weight and uh, it can really bog people down, that number on the scale. Uh, so I think it's really important to take a step back and focus on what you're actually trying to do and the actual performance that you're trying to, to put on and do every day as opposed to a number that nobody knows just by looking at you and doesn't really determine anything else about you at all. So, yep, it's rarely as important as you expect. Um, I mean, it's obviously very important if you are trying to go into a weight class sport, um, but unless you are um, doing that, then there is no need to aim for a specific number. The right number on the scale will be the one where you are able to perform at your best and feel your best over time. Um, I also don't like to focus much on weight because uh, weight isn't a behaviour. It's an outcome of behaviours. So what I would be more interested in looking at is building really good positive behaviours that enhance performance and get you to reach your performance goals as opposed to you know, basing uh, your uh, abilities on a number. Um, obviously, it's, uh, you can't always rely on your appetite for getting things right. So if you are struggling to gain weight, you will need to build in behaviours that support weight gain and things like that. Um, but if, you're, if your team is looking at weight loss, I'd really advise against that because they are still in their growth um, phase and there are certainly a lot of risks with doing more damage than good long term for their performance in sport and their health. All right. One thing that's also really important to touch on uh, is something called red S and it's a relative energy deficiency in sport and it's when so if you were to think the easiest way for me to explain it is that there is a certain amount of energy that your body needs to do its normal me metabolic processes to pump your heart to go get your lungs going and things like that and to grow repair muscles and things and then there is also energy that you need to do your daily activities so your actual uh, conscious activities that you need to do, whether that's sport, whether that's work, whether that's um, studying and things like that. So we need to make sure that we're hitting enough energy for both of these things. And often what can happen if you're not having enough energy uh, throughout your day, you, your body will uh, try and protect itself and it will stop doing a lot of the processes uh, that it should be doing to support normal development. And that's what red S is. So, and it's not always um, associated with weight loss and things like that, but it has some very serious consequences for your longevity in sport, even your fertility, your bone density, and injuries over time. So there are a couple of signs um, that you can, uh, you might notice with red S that are a bit more obvious. Uh, an athlete may not have all of these and they may only have one or two of these if they are suffering from signs of red S. So it may be failing to recover from a training load in time for next session. It's a loss or dysregulation of periods in girls. It may present itself as ongoing fatigue. It may present as reduced performance both in sport and daily activities. So maybe you're not progressing in all of the training that you're doing the way that you might expect. Uh, much higher risk of having fr uh, stress fractures and shin splints, recurring illness, iron deficiency, delayed growth, reduced libido and destabilised mood. So really something to be sort of aware of because it can have really long term consequences. Um, and last, we'll look at supplements. So supplements, uh, they aim to add, to add an additional benefit to performance. However, a lot of the supplements on the market simply don't live up to um, those marketing claims. And even for the handful of supplements that do actually give benefit, those benefits are tiny in the proportions, in the scheme of things. They might only produce a one to 2% difference, if at all. So they're certainly not a priority for most athletes. And instead uh, of spending money on these kinds of supplements, which are often very expensive, the big things to put in place are the big foundational things. So making sure you are getting good quality, adequate sleep, you are hitting your um, 
uh, your nutrients correctly with the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating plus some where you need it. Um, making sure that your training is of quality and value and not overtraining and things like that. And uh, also stress management, whether that be uh, stress related to social life or work or whatever it is, um, managing your stress and things like that. Way more important for actually getting your performance uh, tip top compared to getting having supplements. Um, and if and only if all of these foundations are in place and supplementation is still being considered, the next consideration for competitive athletes is that to make sure that uh, what benefit you're seeking is actually going to be uh, produced by a particular supplement. So uh, not meaning like not falling to just marketing claims and things like that, having a bit more um, uh, nous about you to uh, look into whether something's actually going to do what it's supposed to do and is supported by science. Um, is the supplement on the applicable list of banned substances in sport? This is something that's actually quite important because the way that our um, supplement industry is regulated is, well, not regulated, is really appalling. And anyone can buy supplements and anyone can produce supplements and they do not need to have uh, stringent testing involved to demonstrate that what they say they have on the label is actually what's in the product. It's really, really appalling, but that is something that is on the responsibility then of the athlete to make sure that they are seeking uh, good quality supplements from people who are going that extra step and proving that they have what is in them and they're pure and they don't contain any uh, contaminated uh, elements in them that may be on the list of banned substances. There is an exception, um, as there is most things to supplements, and one of them is protein powders. And the reason it's quite different to most supplements is because it is a concentrated form of one of the key macronutrients. So there are only a couple of reasons why you might consider using protein powder. Um, for example, maybe you're having, uh, you find it challenging to meet your protein targets through food. Uh, maybe after a strenuous session of training, you need to refuel and you find it really difficult to stomach food straight after training. I know that's certainly me. Um, and also the convenience factor. It's um, sometimes a bit more difficult to have good quality protein sources on hand, but having something like a protein powder may be beneficial if that's something that you have issues with. Going a little bit deeper into that, um, the most common uh, proteins that you can buy are whey-based, which is a, like a dairy-based protein, really, really high quality in that case. Um, and then usually there's two major ones available and it's isolate and concentrate, quite similar. Isolate is a bit more, uh, I guess, purified and concentrate still has some of the uh, other beneficial things that are found in, in dairy products in them. And it can contain a little bit more lactose, so if you're someone who has, gets a bit of an upset stomach from lactose, you might consider going for isolate instead. There's casein, which is another milk protein, egg white, collagen, soy, pea, brown rice protein, and things like that. The most, as I've said um, previously, the most biologically compatible proteins are um, the ones from animal sources. Um, with the exception for, in terms of muscle building, the exception is collagen. Um, although it's from an animal source, it's not a great promoter of muscle growth um, because it's actually part of your bones and your skin and things like that, not major component of your muscle tissue. Um, and protein powder is still a supplement uh, and therefore it is still the athlete's responsibility to make sure that it is pure and that it is compliant with testing standards and things like that. All right, and oh, of course. So um, obviously something I've touched on a bit earlier is that social media has quite a big impact on uh, our understanding of nutrition. And there's certainly a lot of information out there and a lot of different people saying a lot of different things, which can make it extremely confusing. Um, there is an, absolute overload of mixed and sometimes really strong messages that may be surprising around nutrition 
and it can make it difficult to decipher um, how something might be applicable to you. And unfortunately, you do not have to have a qualification um, before you spout advice um, about these sorts of things. And really important to note is that personal experience and anecdotes are not adequate substitutes for scientific research and analysis of the literature. So really be, um, my best tips for this are to make sure that you check credentials of people uh, when, you're, when you're considering following their advice and make sure that they, um, if there's someone who is giving uh, information about food and nutrition, it is, you're probably wanting to look for someone who is registered with a governing body, um, which means that they are regulated and that might be a registered nutritionist or an accredited dietitian. Um, I would avoid anybody who tells you to avoid a particular food or a food group. Um, any nutrition professional that is worth their salt will not blanket statement like that um, because nutrition is incredibly individual and there is no such thing as an inherently bad food or inherently good food. It is all a big spectrum and for different people certain things will be beneficial. Um, if they're trying to sell you a supplement or a detox product, steer clear again. They just want your money and they will tell you whatever they want, they want uh, to make sure that you do that. Um, and also what one person shows that they do on social media isn't necessarily representative of what they actually do. They might uh, eat twice as much as what they've demonstrated on social media and they might not have been eating that uh, in order to uh, get the results that they have had either. It's all a complete highlight reel and really isn't necessarily uh, accurate information. And uh, as I said before, credible nutrition sources will not give blanket statements about food being inherently good or bad um, and they will always have caveats in their explanations for things. All right, and the last thing I want to um, finish on is what are the successful habits for an athlete? And what I really want to get um, from having a look at this is an understanding that it's not one thing and it's not, um, it's not one or two things. It is all of these things working synergistically together to get the most out of a particular um, person's life and their uh, sport performance. So the key things that need to be um, focused on to build a really well-rounded athlete are keeping regular sleep, sleeping patterns and having adequate sleep, keeping hydrated throughout the day and making sure that you do have your water bottle handy and trying not to let yourself get to that point where you are really thirsty. Um, making sure that they are set up for their training ahead of time. So back to that uh, principle of sports nutrition being preparedness and preparation. Um, and they eat in accordance with the work that they're going to be performing. So perhaps if they're on a, uh, not on a training day, you wouldn't be eating quite as much as what you would be on a day where you actually need to put in the work. Um, they monitor and manage stress of school, study, work and training and listens to their own body uh, for signs of delayed recovery. And they engage with friends and family to have balance in their lives and they seek professional advice and support to achieve successful habits and work towards goals. I saw this yesterday, um, this quote, and I just, what a perfect thing to put in this presentation. Systems are for people who care about winning repeatedly and goals are for people who care about winning once. So it's not about that one uh, goal that you have in mind, it's about making sure that you are building good systems in place to be prepared for um, everything that comes ahead of you and to make sure that you get that longevity out of, uh, out of everything that you do. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening, guys.